Assalamualaikum and uh, again Dr. Nas is here after a long period with the most demanding topic of the town is aortic stenosis or the valvulars. So uh, I was not here because of my exit exam on the certification in the Pakistan and Alhamdulillah I have achieved that. So I am again here and inshallah we will be giving you the series of lectures on valvular and, and all other topics on which you were requesting to me. So without wasting the time, we will move towards our topic that is the aortic stenosis, the very first topic of the valvular heart diseases. As you know that as name shows, aortic stenosis means there is something stenotic, there is something hampering the blood flow across the aortic valve or across the path of the aortic valve. So uh, cut in short, we will move towards the uh, pathophysiology of the aortic stenosis, how we will approach the aortic stenosis, how we will investigate the aortic stenosis, what will be the natural history of the aortic stenosis, what will be the clinical features of the aortic stenosis, which type of the hypertrophy occurs in the aortic stenosis. We will discuss all these things in this lecture. So first of all that uh, uh, as you know that my drawing is not that much good but I have tried at least that this is sort of some para external long axis view on the trans thoracic echocardiography. So I just want to make you um, uh, uh, make uh, sh show to you guys that there is something hampering in the aortic stenosis. So what are the types of aortic stenosis? Anything which hampers the blood flow across the uh, aortic valve or the pathway towards the aortic valve is aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis can be subvalvular as you appreciate that there, there is something red. Red things are attached to the LVOT or the septal valve of LV. It uh, when it would be more thicker when it comes along the uh, pathway of the LVOT when it comes along the pathway of the aortic valve it causes subvalvular stenosis. So we will so we will uh, we will label it as a subvalvular aortic stenosis. If it is something hampering due to the calcified valve due to the bicuspid valve due to any pathophysiology at the aortic valve we will uh, label it as a valvular aortic stenosis if anything something hampering or anything something like hampers the flow after the aortic valve so we uh, you you can diagnose it as a supravalvular aortic stenosis so these are the types of aortic stenosis subvalvular stenosis valvular stenosis or supravalvular stenosis so uh, uh, how many types of the valve are there when you uh, uh, see the short axis at the transthoracic echocardiography you appreciate in 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 diastole when aortic valve would be closed you appreciate the mercedes benz sign it shows that there are the three uh, cusp one two and three one would be the left cornicus second would be the right cornicus and third would be the non cornicus when there would end when when it closes it looks like the, this and when it opens it should it should look like that the, the all three windows should open separately the all these three windows opens separately when you appreciate that in the close in the in the closed position in the diastole the uh, the aortic valve looks like this but when it opens in the systole it it opens into two windows when the when the two when the two of these three windows would be attached with the rafe it it looks like that if your aortic valve is opening in the two windows in the uh, two doors you will you will label it as a bicuspid aortic valve it is the most important pathophysiology it is the most important association of the aortic stenosis which you have to remember because there are a lot of pathophysiology there are a lot of diseases which are actually associated with this bicuspid aortic valve stenosis what is unicus spirit when you appreciate that there is the only slit like opening and a single commercial is opening in the systole you will label it as a unicus spirit aortic valve second thing is that then when there they, when there would be no commercials at all and only the small opening across the aortic valve will be appreciating uh, you you will be appreciating the only single slit like opening across the aortic valve you will label it as a a commercial aortic valve stenosis so these all are the types, these all are the 
causes of the aortic stenosis or the more the most important cause of the aortic stenosis in the developed countries is the calcification and the degeneration of the aortic valve when there would be the because these are the high pressure valves when b, b, due to the aging process due to the atherosclerosis project process due to the degenerative diseases due to the calcification deposition uh, uh, secondary to degenerative diseases it causes the wear and tear of the valve and it causes the valvular stenosis it causes the calcification deposition on the valvular uh, part or the valves of the aortic valve and it causes the valvular aortic stenosis which is the most common cause of the aortic stenosis in the developed countries why because the life expectancy in the developed countries is more than the developing countries and this usually this aortic valve stenosis the degenerative disease uh, uh, occurs in the uh, people elderly than the 65 or 70 years but in developing countries, the bicuspid aortic valve is the most common congenital disease and it is also the most common cause of the aortic stenosis in the developing world, so in such, as, such as Pakistan or, or other uh, subcontinent countries. Because the life expectancy of these population is not that much higher as in the developed or the Western countries. So one thing more which I want to hear uh, the, the, uh, in, the, in the causes of aortic stenosis there are the, uh, the as, as I told you the most common is calcification in the developing in the secondary uh, and the second one is the most common is in these developing countries that is the bicuspid aortic valve. But there are a lot of more things which are associated with the bicuspid aortic valve or what is bicuspid? There is a fusion of the two cusps. The fusion of the two cusps uh, causes the bicuspid aortic valve. So the most common fusion is between the right coronary cusp and the left coronary cusp. It is around 79% common in bicuspid aortic valve. But in 19% of the cases, the right coronary cusp is fuses with the non coronary cusp and the rest is the rest fusion remains around one or something, one, one to two percent in, uh, in the population. So the most common is the fusion of the right coronary with the left coronary cusp, which is 79%. The right coronary and the non coronary cusp is around 19%. So the most important thing is the association of the bicuspid valve. If, you, if, if a patient presenting to you with the bicuspid aortic valve, how do you approach? For what other things you will have to look for uh, in, in your patient with the bicuspid aortic valve, you have to look for the coaptation of the aorta. In around 80% of the patients with the bicuspid aortic valve, you will get the coaptation of the aorta. So, and the coaptation of aorta is very much common there. So, we have to rule out, we have to look for the signs of the coaptation of aorta. And the in investigation, we have to look for the coaptation of aorta uh, by, uh, either, either in echocardiography or in the CT or MRI. Second thing is that the aortic aneurysm. Aortic aneurysm is again very much common because it causes the dilatation, it causes the thinning of the aortic valve, so it causes the aortic aneurysmal formation in the aorta, secondary to bicuspid aortic valve. You have to look for uh, that as well. And the, and the, and the uh, last but not the least is the shown complex, which is the, the most important complex in the uh, congenital cardiology or the, or, or, or the patients having the congenital cardiac problems. So what is the Sean complex? Sean complex is very famous complex, most usually asking question in our examinations. It, con it contains the four things. It contributed four things or all these are the stenosis. Number one is supramitral ring. Supra mitral ring. As you are appreciating that there is this is LA, this is mitral valve, and there is something uh, which I draw here that there is something ring like structure over the mitral valve, it causes the supra valvular stenosis, supra valvular mitral ring. Number two is single papillary muscles. As you know, that there should be two papillary muscles for which the three cordae of the posterior leaflet and the three cordae of the anterior leaflet should attach separately but here it causes this uni the the uh, single attachment of all cordae to this papillary muscle causes what the parachute mitral valve and it 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 looks like parachute why because the three cordae of this and three cordae of this causes the attachment of to this uh, uh, papillary muscle and it causes it causes the doming of the mitral valve and it looks like parachute mitral valve so number one is para supramitral ring supramitral uh, valvular ring uh, supravalvular mitral ring number two is parachute mitral valve and number three is subvalvular stenosis 
subvalvular stenosis or subvalvular membrane which causes hampering the, uh, the blood flow across the LVOT uh, is also an association of Thion complex and number four is the coeptation of the aorta. So these four things when comes uh, uh, come together it causes and it is called as Thion complex which has a very strong association with the bicuspid aortic valve. So the bicuspid and, uh, and I'm sure that I have made myself clear about the Schoen complex. You have to uh, uh, keep this in your mind that what is Schoen complex? Number one, supra valvular mitral ring, parachute mitral valve, subvalvular stenosis and the coefficient of aorta causes the Schoen complex. So how would you approach your patient? How patient presents to you? Usually most of the time, uh, patient has some degenerative changes or patient has some bicuspid aortic valve then when your patient present uh, will uh, uh, will be presenting to you with the complaint usually the complaints are these three heart failure symptoms syncope and the chest pain but when why and how they occurs so we have to move towards the natural history which is very much important because natural history decides that when patient will be presenting to you in in the future so if uh, if anyone has like some aortic disease or bicuspid or degenerative disease in the aortic valve the gradient air increases by 7 millimeter mercury per air it increases 7 millimeter mercury per air until it becomes the uh, gradients of uh, uh, severity which we will discuss in next lecture that would be more than 30 or 40 but we will discuss uh, right now I am not making you confused you just remember that the natural history that whenever there would be the increase of 7 millimeter mercury per year and the velocity rises 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 per year and the, then area decreases by 0 0.1 centimeter per square per year then it this history decides that when your patient is coming to you when and uh, with keeping this uh, with keeping this history in your mind you have to follow your patients with the echocardiography and the CT scans so if your patient has the like rapidly progression of the uh, gradients and the velocity and the decreasing of the area you have to follow your patients more vigilantly you have to intervene more vigilantly but what it cause uh, uh, what they could do which it actually poses your patient towards the heart failure syncope and the chest pain they actually does what they increases the pressure volume overload which causes the left ventricular hypertrophy then the pressure volume overload in in the LV how pressure volume overload occurs when there would be the decrease flow across the aortic valve there would be the, then heart has to heart has to work and heart has to contract more efficiently to uh, make flow of that blood from LV or to uh, uh, send this blood from LV to the system because there is a hampering across the aortic valve or LVOT or the supravalvular stenosis. What happens then the pressure overload conditions occur and it causes the left ventricular hypertrophy. When the left ventricular hypertrophy occurs, there would be the diastolic dysfunction. Why? Because there would be the there would be hypertrophy of the muscles and it causes increased LVDP. Increase LVDP. When there would be increased LVDP, so LA has problem to decrease uh, to to emptying its blood from LA to LV because because the LV has higher diastolic pressures and uh, for. Uh, for, for the clear understanding of this LVDP you have to watch or you have to uh, listen or watch all my lectures on the diastolic dysfunction then you will easily understand the phenomena of the raised LVDP in the LVH patients or the patient with the aortic stenosis. What have what occurs when there will be the LV hypertrophy it the pressure of the LV would be increases in the diastole and that increased pressure of LV of the LV in the diastole causes hampering of flow blood from LA to LV which causes enlargement of LA when there would be enlargement of LA the backflow pressure in the lungs again increases it increases the lung if it increases the pulmonary capillary wage pressure, it increases the venous hypertension, 
in the in the pulmonary vessels so it causes the pulmonary edema it causes the signs of heart failure this is why the patient feels the shortness of breath in the aortic stenosis why because of the increased lvdp and after persistence increment of the lvdp the heart fails then one uh, once the uh, uh, lv uh, diastolic dysfunction occurs after that there would be the lv systolic dysfunction which is the stage 2 of aortic stenosis with which we will discuss later on then there would be the supply demand mismatch why because lv has to contract more lv has to work more lv has to work more to pump the blood from lv to system but the blood which is going across the aorta is less when it is less it it, it needs more blood but aorta is not supplying enough blood to the coronaries which are actually arising from this cus to this this or like this so there is again less blow, blood flow in the coronaries which which are supplying the coronary um, uh, to, to, to the lv but lv has to work more so again it it, it creates a supply demand mismatch which again creates a problem for aortic stenotic patients and patients feel chest pain patient feels chest pain why chest pain because there is less supply but there is a more demand and there lv has to contract more to push the blood across the stenotic valve so uh, yes and second thing is that that there is a fixed lvot there is a fixed Uh, amount of blood which has to come from lv to aorta why because there is a stenosis in the aortic valve so it causes the fixed demand when there would be increased demand or when there would be the peripheral vasodilation it decreases the blood flow in the in the brain it decreases the it decreases the blood flow in brain and causes what it causes syncope so these are the major symptomatology and this is the main symptoms of the aortic stenosis but if the patient develops heart failure with severe severe stenosis with the severe aortic stenosis usually the total survival of all patient with the heart failure and severe stenosis is not more than 2 years most of the time the all patients god forbid will be die within 2 years or after 2 year, within within span of the 2 years if they have symptoms of heart failure and you left them untreated then the syncope if the patient has complaints of syncope then the 50% of the patients with syncope will die in 3 years that is the important thing that the patient with a heart failure has the absolute and the total survival of not more than 2 years but the patient of syncope yes they may live more than 3 years but the 50% of the patient will die within 3 years and chest pain then if the patient has a chest uh, the history of chest pain with no atherosclerotic disease and that chest pain is just because of the supply demand mismatch because of the aortic stenosis then the 50% of the patient will die within within 5 years but 50% yes they may will uh, live longer than the 5 years but in heart failure the total survival is not more than 2 years so which type of hypertrophy occurs in an aortic stenosis that is the type of hypertrophy that we call it concentric hypertrophy because hypertrophy occurs in both lesions stenotic lesions as well as in the as well as in the regurgitant lesions but the important thing is that which type of hypertrophy are uh, we have we have most of the most of the time we have three or four types of hypertrophy number one is concentric number 2 it eccentric number 3 is lv remodeling and number is normal like in athletes so usually in patient with aortic stenosis we have the concentric type of the hyper hypertrophy so what concentric hypertrophy uh, has has the clinic uh, like has the features so concentric hypertrophy has a relative all thickness it has the more relative all thickness in regurgitant lesion there would be the less re relative all thickness so how much relative all thickness would be there more than 0.4 in aortic stenotic patient and there would be more lv mass and that mass would be more than 115 in females uh, sorry in males and 
per, uh, is in 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 uh, 95 grams in male so in uh, concentric hypertrophy there will be more relative all thickness of the lv and there would be lv mass would be also more than the normal or other other types of hypertrophy so it is very important that you should uh, you should differentiate between concentric hypertrophy and regurgitated hypertrophy i am repeating that in concentric hypertrophy there will be more there would be more relative all thickness and there would be more mass in male or as well as in female but the numbers are different in male and its number is also different for the females now the important thing is that in aortic stenosis how we will do the exam obviously you have a, 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 a patient has come to you in the clinic you have asked the symptoms the patient is complaining to you heart failure and uh, you have asked about, asked about the all the history in the previous years patient has you have ruled out the causes then now you have to do what you have to do the clinical exam of your patient and then you will move towards the ecg chest x-ray and the echocardiography and then you will decide the plan and then you will categorize your patient according to the guidelines that in which category your patient lies and then you will treat them accordingly so we will briefly discuss also the guidelines of 2020 in this lecture as well